This is a lecture for my seventh hour class on the 5th of April. Anyway, uh, and so Taft, uh, Taft became president of the United States. I want you to write this down about Taft. Taft <clears throat> was a progressive, just like TR. They were both progressives. That means they were liberals. But Taft, now listen to what I'm going to say. I'm going to try to do this as painlessly as possible. But Taft was not as progressive as Roosevelt. Taft was not as progressive as Roosevelt. Wasn't as liberal as Roosevelt. And you know, <clears throat> for seven and a half years, TR had been president of the United States. And in those seven and a half years, uh, he had used government, get this down, to regulate. In other words, make them follow the rules. That's what regulate is, follow the rules. The big coal companies, the big railroads, the big oil companies, the meat industry, and many other big corporations. He had said to the big corporations, you have to follow the rules like everyone else. And he restricted what they could do. Okay? And who's the enforcer here? Government. It's government. Government. And by the way, half bleed. Taft believed the same thing. Taft believed the same thing. But guess what? And, and by the way, there was nothing that Roosevelt liked better than a, a fight of any kind, but a political fight. And when he was getting all these things passed through the Congress, those conservative Republicans, those conservative Republicans hated it. And they fought Roosevelt, and he fought them, but Roosevelt whipped them. Okay? He didn't give them any wiggle room. But when Taft comes in, Taft's different personality. Taft is big and jovial. He laughs a lot. And Taft's view of the world is, we don't need to fight about everything. Yeah, once in a while we're going to have some disagreements, you conservatives and we progressives. But we can just sit down and talk about it. You with me? We can, in other words, get this down. Taft was more willing to compromise. And, of course, Roosevelt had beaten the sap out of the conservatives. And when Roosevelt leaves, the conservatives breathe this big sigh of relief. You with me? And they say, Roosevelt's gone. We can get around Taft. You understand what I'm talking about? We can bend the rules. We can maybe get it back to the way it was. Not entirely, but maybe get it back to the way it was before TR was present, okay? You with me, you understand that. And that's going to be a big problem for Taft, because Taft tries, Roosevelt was just like a bulldog. He would just flash those big teeth and just go, let's just go ahead the head. You don't like my environmental program? You want to build a hotel on the Grand Canyon? Try it. See how it works out for you, because I'm going to beat you. Taft was, well, let's talk about it. And so they think, we can get around Taft. Right? You understand that? So that's going to be that's going to be a big problem uh, for for uh, Taft. Okay. By the way, Taft Taft. I want you to get this down about him. His first love was the law. He was a lawyer and he loved the law. In fact, his goal in life was listen. It was to serve on the Supreme Court. And he just became president. He just kind of you know Roosevelt just kind of bustled him into it. It just kind of was a detour. And by the way, when he got to be president, he was absolutely miserable. He hated it. You know, there's an old saying, be careful what you wish for. You might just get it. And Taft was pretty miserable, okay, as president. And by the way, he ends up a one-termer. He only serves four years. People are going to vote him out of office. But later, he will be appointed to the Supreme Court, okay? Later, he will be appointed. There's a presidential court, but he'll be appointed to the Supreme Court. In a few weeks, I'm going to have some of you follow students up in the Supreme Court, and the most famous, you know, the 240 years of Supreme Court justices, the most famous ones, they have a bust out there. That That is in the Supreme Court. You can see the whole building's made out of marble. I don't know if we can afford to build a building like that today. But there's William Howard Taft. You see, from 1921 to 1930, he was the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court. And then finally, he was happy. I guess there's a lesson in that for all of us. If you're not happy right now, don't give up, you know, happiness. Winston Churchill didn't reach his goal until he was 65 years old. 
He fought and fought and failed and fought and failed and fought. I know we think peace ought to happen now. You know, clap your hands and I'm the whip. But there's a lesson in that. There's a lesson in that. You know, hang on. You know, you may get there. Well, Taft did, and he, he died a happy man. He was doing what he loved the most on the Supreme Court. And by the way, he's the only former president that uh, ever served on the court. He's the only former president. By the way, he's our largest president. He's not our tallest. Who was our tallest? Lincoln. Lincoln. Lincoln was, well, it's a tie between, the, I, I, I agree with you all. I think it's Lincoln. Lincoln was 6'4 or 6'5. Lyndon Johnson, who served in the 1960s, he was 6'4 or 6'5. Okay, but I think Lincoln might have beaten him by a half inch or so, an eighth of an inch or so. But anyway, Lincoln's up. Taft wasn't our tallest. He was only 6'2, but he weighed 400 pounds. Okay. Uh, there's a fish, you know, you like that, weigh 400 pounds. You, know, you really can't tell. I mean, you know, he's a husky sort of guy in that picture, but you know, that's painted by an artist. There's a picture of him playing golf. Okay, there's Taft. Right? He's our biggest president. And there's a story about Taft and his bathtub. I want to dispel this. You know, there's a story that when Taft got to the white, you know, Roosevelt's a little guy. He walked in, he tried to take a bath, and he got stuck in the bathtub. Okay, this is just a story. It didn't happen. But they had to grease the sides and push him out. Okay, and if that had been true, people tell that for the truth. If that had been true, that would have been the most embarrassing presidential moment in the, in the history of the United States. But there is a deal with the bathtub with him. Uh, Taft, you know, there's Taft with his hand on a telephone. That's what a telephone looked like in 1908. Uh, but uh, there's Taft's bathtub. Okay, yeah. Uh, he did go up and look at that little bathtub and he said, I can't get in it. So they had to bring this new bathtub. And you go home and measure your bathtub and see how big it is. Taft's bathtub was 42 inches wide and it was eight feet long. And it weighed two and a half tons. Okay. It took four men to install it. It's in a museum today, but it took four men to install that. And before the fire back in 95, somewhere, I, before all of this stuff, all this conflict, I'd gotten a picture. I used to hold up pictures in class. This is so much better. You know how fortunate you are. But uh, I had a picture you know, I picked up somewhere. Uh, the, those four people installed that bathtub. Four grown men, plumbers, and then when they had it installed, they all sat inside of it, and they're peering over the side. They look like little dwarfs sitting in that bathtub. That bathtub could hold four grown men. So that's that's Taft's bathtub, okay? So I wanted to put the bathtub where he didn't get stuck. If he had tried to get, I think if he tried to get Teddy Roosevelt's bathtub, he would have, but he didn't do that. Also, he got rid of the horses at the White House because they couldn't find a horse that could hold him up. There he is, look at that. Look at that poor animal. He was governor of the Philippines. Okay. And he's riding a wildebeest. And you're, you're not, you can't see this poor animal's face, but this is, <laughs> it looks like he's saying, help me. <laughs> but there's Taft. So Taft, you know, he couldn't even get up on a horse. So Taft did away with the stalls, the corral, not a corral, but the stables. And he built garages. And he's the one that brings the first cars to the White House. Uh, the devil wagons is Teddy. That, that, that's making me tired. I'm going to move that. Uh, Taft did that. Um, you know, he, there he is. You don't have to write this down, but just a few, a couple of weeks ago, Joe Biden did this. Beginning with Taft, you know, in those days, baseball was America's national sport. It was good politics. And so Taft went down. And at the beginning of the 1910 baseball season, I think he threw out a ball uh, to officially open baseball season. And every president since him has done that. They all go down to a stadium and throw out a ball. Joe Biden did it a couple of weeks ago when baseball season started. Okay, There's Mrs. Taft, okay? And there's his military aide behind him. And so there's the president throwing out a ball. And that's become a big... That's become a big tradition in America. Write this down. This is important. Uh, he, he's the president who built the Oval Office. Have you heard of the Oval Office? Yes. Okay, that's the president's office, okay? There's the White House. The Oval Office. You know, when uh, 
Teddy Roosevelt was president. The president lived in the White House and his office was in the White House. The Taft is going to go out here west of the White House and Teddy Roosevelt had his tennis court there. And uh, Taft is going to tear up Teddy Roosevelt's tennis court and he built that oval shaped office there and all of this. There was a show on television not too many years ago called The West Wing. You ever hear of that? Yeah, well, anyway, it was about politics in Washington. This, if you hear someone refer to the West Wing, this is it. This is called the residence now. That's where the president lives. His office is here. And every morning, Joe Biden will get up and he will walk over to the West Wing uh, and go into the Oval Office. Uh, this is the press room right here. The press will gather there. The president can walk just like walking through that door to that hallway. If he wants to address the press, he can walk right out and start talking to him. He has a press secretary. It's a woman now uh, at this point, and every day she briefs the press. The press will gather in there just like you're sitting, and she'll come behind the podium like this, and she'll say, at 9 o'clock this morning, the president's going to meet with the president of France. At 2 o'clock this afternoon, he's going to meet with some labor leaders. Uh, at 3.30, he's going to meet with a group of Girl Scouts from Peoria, and let them you know, gives them the president's schedule, and then she'll take a few questions. Um, uh, and if the president wants to come in, he can just walk right out of the Oval Office. This is where cabinet meetings take place, and there are all sorts of officials that work for the administration there. Uh, there's the inside of the Oval Office. That's when Donald Trump was president. Okay, and by the way, every president, uh, every president decorates it differently. Okay, but that's the Oval Office. Uh, there's another shot of President Trump's Oval Office. You see that desk. The White House basement is full of desks. The president gets to pick whatever desk he wants. Most of them sit behind that desk, okay? That desk is called the resolute desk. You know what resolute means? Determined, okay? You remember Queen Victoria from the Spanish-American War? When she, she gave, there was a British warship, one of the old wooden ships. They were being replaced, and there was one called the HMS Resolute, and so they cut big timbers out of the uh, HMS Resolute, and they built that desk, and that's called the Resolute Desk. And most presidents uh, sit behind the Resolute Desk, although you can bring in anyone that you want. There's a picture. That must be on a Saturday or a weekend. Uh, there's President Obama. He ought to be, if you go in the Oval Office, you ought to wear a tie. There's some, I don't know who that is. He ought to have a tie on. You have new, but... You know, that's probably on a late Saturday or afternoon or Sunday morning when the government is in session. Some problems come up that he's trying to address, and he's got a few of his advisors there to help him work through the problem. But anyway, that's the Oval Office, and Taft, Taft, built, uh, the Oval, Taft built the Oval Office. I want you to also write this down. Taft uh, got a lot done when he was president. You know, Roosevelt, remember Teddy Roosevelt? He was loud rambunctious. When he did something, when he accomplished something, he all, they almost had to they almost had to keep restrain him from going up on top of the White House with a bullhorn and shouting, you know, what he had done. He's a show off. Well Taft did in that way. Get this down. Taft is not like that. He's easy going. But you know what? He got a lot done. He set aside, listen, he set aside, you know, Roosevelt set aside 300 million acres of forest land said to the big uh, to the lumber companies, you can't cut that. That's pretty impressive. <clears throat> Taft set aside three times the amount of forest land that Roosevelt did. And that's why you can go see these great virgin forests that have been here ever since this continent was created. Uh, uh, thanks to uh, thanks to Taft. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's fun. I was going to ask you if there's anybody following me. Okay. Anybody else? Okay. So anyway, he, and by the way, you remember we call Teddy Teddy the Teddy, 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 call Teddy the trust buster. How many trusted? How many? What is a trust? Monopoly. Monopoly. Very good. Excellent. Uh, how many monopolies did uh, Taft? Forty-four. Taft broke up ninety. Okay. So you don't hear anybody talking about Taft because Taft wasn't, wasn't a bragger. He wasn't a show off. Like TR was. Well, like I say, these big oil companies and lumber companies uh, and coal companies said we can get around Taft. And Taft tried to work with them. Get this down. Whereas Roosevelt would have 
bitten them like a rabid dog, almost literally. Taft tried to work with them. And guess what? I'm just going to skip over a lot of things and get to the point. Cut to the chase, as they say. Uh, Taft uh, tried to work with these big companies. And listen, and listen, these conservative Republicans, Taft's a progressive Republican, and they took advantage of him. Get this down. They took advantage of him. Okay? They got around him. Now listen to what I'm going to say to you. And they started, they started, the conservatives in Congress started to roll back or do away with a lot of the laws that Roosevelt had passed. Okay? A lot of the regulations. They started doing away. The meat companies say, huh. You know, we don't have to we don't have to make sure that the dead rats don't go in the bats. We can get away with that with Taft. They couldn't have with Roosevelt, but we you understand what I'm saying? They do find ways to get around it. And get and get this down. And this greatly upsets the Roosevelt Republicans. This greatly upsets the Roosevelt Republicans. Listen, right now the Republican Party, today, while I'm speaking to you, the, my party, I'm a Republican, the Republican Party is divided. They're divided between Trump Republicans and what they call regular Republicans. I'm one of the regular Republicans, okay? But there's a split. There are some of us that the last thing we want is Donald Trump to get the Republican nomination, which I predict he will. And the last thing we want is for him to be elected president, which I predict he will. Yes. Is Taft president right now? Yes, Taft is president. Yeah. TR is often, where is TR? Africa. Africa. He's lying, honey, okay? Yeah. But you understand that the Republican Party split right now, and then, by the way, that's not good for a party. You know, this is 2023. Next year, we're going to elect the president. It's not good for a party to be divided, right, going into a presidential election. So we're so we're divided today. By the way, what happened to President Trump the other day? First time in history it ever happened to a president. He was indicted for a crime. I think that's the dumbest thing I ever heard, and I don't like Trump. You won't find anybody more anti-Trump than me, but I think that's ridiculous. Listen, you know, let's put the facts on the table here. What, 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 is, what, is, what is this guy indicting Trump for, for having an affair with a porn star and then paying her off Stormy Daniels? Not a good, great name for a porn star. Uh, you know, having an affair with a porn star and then paying her off so she wouldn't say anything when he was running for president. Well, he got told for that. Yeah. Thank it's you. not that big of a deal. What? Thank you. Thank you. Listen, if every politician that had, you know, probably paid off someone, someone they'd have an affair with, uh, all the way back to the Duke of Wellington in 1815 in England, you know, he had an affair before he became the Prime Minister of England with a notorious prostitute in London. And once he became the Prime Minister, you know, once Wellington was a great national hero. He, he beat Napoleon in a battle called the Battle of Waterloo. And he was elected prime minister, and this prostitute wrote him, and she wanted some money. And he would, you know, now that you're rich and famous, give you some money. And he said, forget it. And she wrote him back, and she said, uh, if you don't give me that money, she said, I'm going to publish a book, and I'm going to tell everything. And Wellington wrote her back a one-sentence reply. He said publish and be damned. And that was the end of it, okay? Uh, you know, if a president or anyone else commits a serious crime, I think the American public is just like you. Yeah. yeah. But you like know you what? Guys. You know what? Trump has said all along that the government's persecuting me because I stand up for you, the American people, and those people up in Washington are persecuting me. Is he going to be able to use this? Mm -hmm. Sure he is. You know, I watched him last night. He came out of Trump Towers and made a little talk about, you know, that, you know, and he acted angry. And I bet they're behind closed doors. I bet they're doing backflips. They're so happy about him. Oh, yeah, for sure. What I said is, when, when they, said, they said, I said, if they indict him, they, they just elected him, re-elected him president. I don't like that, but I don't care what I don't like. I think that's what's, I think that's what's going to happen. If you're a Trump supporter, and say, well, gee, I, that, I take comfort in that. Don't take too much comfort. I also said Hillary Clinton would be president, so I uh, kind of missed on that one. So, but anyway, I think I think overall this is this is good for 
for Donald Trump. So are they just like not supposed to be human no more? Like not have any like? Well, you know, on the other hand, I mean, you know, look, we want our our leaders uh, to have certain oh, yeah. moral standards. Yeah, that's someone from our class down there. Oh, it could be Ari from uh, ACT. Who is that? What are you doing? <laughs> Come on in. Don't stand out there and have a conversation. Why not? Slow down. Uh, anyway, anyway, back to what I was saying. Uh, the. Uh, uh, Republican Party right now is divided, but we expect our leaders, you know, to have certain certain moral standards. But they're, you know, they're just. I mean, look, this is the same thing the Republicans tried to do to Bill Clinton, which you probably don't remember Bill Clinton, but uh, he had an affair while he was president in the Oval Office. In the Oval Office, I just showed you with a White House intern. He was a fifty-year-old married man with a child, and he had an affair with the. Uh, uh, a young intern who was 21 years old, and I can't believe it, uh, uh, Monica Lewinsky, okay, and the Republicans said, oh, we're going to have, and the Republicans impeached him, and the American people, you know, the American people just kind of went yawn, you know, uh, that's Clinton's business, you know, you're digging into someone's bedroom, and we don't like that, for you that just got here, we're having class, so get out of your notebooks. So you had a day off. Anyway, uh, anyway, um, Taft uh, would compromise with these uh, conservative conservative Republicans. And get this down, that offended, that made the progressive Roosevelt Republicans, that made the progressive Roosevelt Republicans angry, okay? So the party's splitting between TR Republicans and Taft Republicans, okay? And again, Taft, they're both TR, I just want to make this clear, both Taft and TR are progressives, but Taft leans a little bit more conservative than Roosevelt, okay? And he's willing to deal with these big corporations that some of them take advantage of. Well, all of this came to a head, get this down, in 1910, Remembering that the next presidential election is in 1912, all of this came to a head in 1910 at a cabinet meeting. Uh, by the way, I've explained to you before what the cabinet is, but there's Donald Trump's cabinet, okay? That's a cabinet meeting in process, or in progress right there. Uh, there you see Donald Trump, President, you see Mike Pence, the Vice President. There's the Secretary. I can pick out a few of these. There's the Secretary of the Treasury. There's the Secretary of State, a guy named Rex Tillerson. Tillerson, I think Tillerson. But all of these people are officials. They're all cabinet secretaries, and they all advise the president on different issues: some on education, some on defense, some on agriculture, some on the Treasury, some on foreign affairs. That's what a cabinet does. And in 1910, Taft, get this down, was having a, uh, a, ca a cabinet meeting. The cabinet meets. 1910, he was having a cabinet meeting. And um, <clears throat> when Taft had become president, when Taft had become president, he uh, appointed his own cabinet. The old Roosevelt cabinet was out, and you had a new Taft cabinet. But he kept one, get this down, he kept one Roosevelt member of the cabinet because Taft felt like Roosevelt was his mentor, Roosevelt was his best friend. Taft believed that it was probably true he would have never been president without Roosevelt. So he kind of felt like, oh, oh the ex-president something. So I'm not going to get rid of the entire Roosevelt cabinet. I'm going to keep one member of the cabinet. And the man he kept was uh, the chief forester. Okay. Does anybody remember who Roosevelt had appointed? You know, what Roosevelt had created. There was no chief forester when Roosevelt came along. He had created this. Does anybody remember what the chief forester's name was? Gifford. Gifford. Uh, Pen Pinchot. Write that down. So Pinchot, who is a progressive, liberal, 
PR Republican stays in Taft's cabinet. At the same time, Taft, get this down, appoints a man named Richard Ballinger to the cabinet. Richard Ballinger. And Richard Ballinger is the Secretary of the Interior. Okay? And we have a Secretary, Secretary, excuse me, of the Interior. I don't know who it is today. You can look it up, but we have one today. And here's what, listen, here's what the Secretary of the Interior is, is responsible for. Excuse me. Let me deal with this annoying person. Hello? Hello? I'm oh, fine. How are you? Anyway, <laughs> Ballinger is the Secretary of the Interior. Get this down. And the Secretary of the Interior deals with public lands, okay? The Secretary of the Interior, are you with me? He deals with public lands and public monuments. Who runs the National Park? Who, who runs Yellowstone National Park? Who runs Yosemite National Park? Who runs the Grand Canyon in this country right now today? Who's in charge of that? Secretary, Secretary of the Interior. Who's in charge of the Gettysburg Battlefield? Who's in charge of the White House? The White House is a national monument. Who, who takes care of the upkeep of that? The Secretary of the Interior. <clears throat> Would you say then that these two guys, that their jobs sort of overlap? Yes. Does that make sense to you? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Everybody with me so far? Well, that's as smooth as that's gone in a long time. Good. They overlap. So they're at a cabinet meeting. And, uh, uh, you know, they're discussing several issues. And Ballinger, get this down. And by the way, uh, Ballinger is a conservative Taft Republican. Okay? So you got a TR man here and a Taft man here. And they both essentially have the same responsibilities. And you know, when TR was president, where did the big coal companies want to go sink a shaft? Alaska. Right up here, get this down in the Alaskan wilderness. And what chance did they have to do that when the TR was president? No, Not right. a chance. I mean, that was, as they say, that's the hill the TR would die on. But guess what? They talked to Ballinger. And Ballinger said, well, you know, if you'll put it back like it was before you dug the coal, what are you shaking your head about? If you'll put it back, you know, I'll talk to the president about it. And so at the cabinet meeting, he brought this up. He said, I think we ought to let the coal companies mine coal in the Alaska wilderness. And what did this TR, progressive liberal, Gifford Pinchot, say about that? No. You know, he said, not no, hell no. He just exploded. And I mean, this big fight breaks out there in the cabinet. Those two going at each other. And of course, who's going to be the person who decides what they do? Taft, that's exactly true. That's David Taft side with. Richard. Hmm? Richard. Well, what's his last name? Ballinger. 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 Why'd he do that? Because Ballinger was his man. He had appointed Ballinger. This was a PR man. And he appointed Ballinger. Get this down. And when he did that, <clears throat> Pinchot resigned from the cabinet, stormed out of the room. And get the what? The Repu when, when that happens, this is called the Ballinger Pinchot affair. When that happens, the um, the uh, progressives break with Taft. They said, we will not support Taft anymore. It tears the party in two. And by the way, those progressives, they go home and they start writing letters to who? TR. TR, who's where? Africa. In Africa, right down here. All these letters saying Taft is destroying everything you accomplished. Taft is destroying the party. Taft is going to destroy the country. He sold out to the conservatives. You've got to come home and save us. Well, get this down. In 1910, T.R. came home. Here's a funny story about T.R. So on the way home from Africa, he went through Europe. And in those days, Europe was ruled by kings and queens, and he had to meet all these kings, and he had to go to all this formal dress, and he had to meet these kings and queens. And finally, when he met the last one, he said, take me home to the United States. He said, if I see one more king, I'll bite him. 
Okay? <laughs> so they put PR on the ship and they send him home. And he comes into New York. Okay, the 1910. By the way, do you know what Halley's Comet? You know what Halley's Comet is? Have you heard that? H A L L E Y S. Halley's Comet. It's a, comet. it's a big comet, gigantic, and it appears every 75 years, like clockwork. And uh, it appeared in 1910. It had appeared in 1835, and 75 years later is 1910. It appeared, and the Roosevelt supporters said it's a sign from God. Roosevelt's coming home to save us. By the way, Mark Twain also died. Remember Mark Twain? He died in 1910. He was born in 1835. He always said all his life, he said, I came in with Haley's Comet, and I'll go out with Haley's Comet. And he did. He died in 1910. Meanwhile, Roosevelt comes, 75 years old. Meanwhile, Roosevelt comes home. And he, and he, came in, he comes into New York Harbor. And a million people come out to cheer him. Uh, I'll tell you this. You know where Ponca City, Oklahoma is? Up north of Tulsa, north and a little west of Tulsa. There were two brothers. One was 10, that's third grader, I think. And one was six, that's first grader. And they got on a horse in Ponca City, Oklahoma. And they rode all by themselves all the way to New York City on that horse to stand on the pier and cheer Teddy Roosevelt when he came back to the United States. Isn't that amazing? Your parents won't, well, you're in high school, and your parents won't let you cross the street by yourself. They won't let you build your floats. You know, they come and go, oh, I gotta build these floats. You know, if little Jethro cries, he'll cut his arm off or something. So, yeah, yeah. A 10 year old, a six year old ride on a horse all the way to New York from Ponca City, Oklahoma. And Roosevelt came in on six battleships. It was just typical show off. And you see this huge battleship, and you see this little fat speck on the front of it, waving his hat, standing there, and the guns are booming. Okay, they're firing blanks. They're not showing New York City, but the guns are moving, and Roosevelt's standing there cheering. Uh, and behind him, the backdrop is the Statue of Liberty. I want to tell you something. Hollywood couldn't have created a better scene. Mm. And the ships pull in. Roosevelt gets off the battleship. He walks uh, down the plank. And there's the press of not just the United States, but the world. They're down there waiting on him. And they got one big question for Teddy Roosevelt. What is that? Are you still friends with that? No. Are you going to be president? Are you going to run for president? And what did he say? No. 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 Are you crazy? But then they tell I've been president once. It was the greatest honor, one of the greatest honors, except for Sam Juan Hill, one of the greatest honors of my life. But I'm going home. I've had enough of that. I'm going to go up to Sagamore Hill. By the way, here's this very beautiful home. It's a national monument today. It's in the Hudson River Valley of New York. Uh, there it is, Sagamore Hill. There's one of the rooms in it. You can see elephant tusks and buffalo heads and deer heads, you know, and all the stuff that Roosevelt killed in his lifetime. That's one of the, isn't that a beautiful room? Yeah, it's a beautiful place. He said, I'm going back up there. He said, I'm not going to get him. What was he really saying? You got to learn to read between the lines. Right now, we're approaching a presidential election, and there are all sorts of people asking Republicans, are you going to run for president? Are you? And what are all of them saying? No, 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 I'm not going to run. What are they really saying? We still support the other Republicans? No. Well, that the Democrats are going to win? Well, no. Republicans aren't. What, what, what do they mean when they say we're going to go back and fix everything? They're saying I'm running. When these politicians all say, nope, nope, farthest thing from my mind, they can't sleep at night because they're thinking about how great it would be if they were president. And when, you know, when Teddy Roosevelt steps off that ship and they say, are you running? He says, absolutely not. He should have been holding up a big sign saying, I'm running for president. But he goes back up to Sagamore Hill, get this down, like he said he would, and he's bored out of his mind, okay? <clears throat> but every progressive in the country, every leading progressive in the country makes it his business to come up there to Roosevelt and say, you got to run. you got to save the country. So in 1910, Moving on here. Got this down. 19, so he comes home 1910. That same, excuse me, 1912. I'm sorry. 1912. He goes up to goes to Kansas. You're not sitting very far from where he went. Just, just right, he goes to Kansas. But the place he went was Osawatomie Creek. We can get the school van and be up there a few hours. Osawatomie Creek. And get this. 30,000 people stood, stood 
while Roosevelt gave a two-hour speech. 30,000 people. And in that speech, get this down. He said, this is what the country needs. He said, we need a new program. And my program, get this down, is the new nationalism. Put that in quotes. Roosevelt said, this is what the country needs, the new nationalism. That's his program. I always associate the new nationalism with Teddy Roosevelt. Now, listen. What did the new nationalism say? What did he say the country needed? He's a progressive. What did the progressive stand for? Change. change. Huh? Change. Well, what kind of change specifically? Change the workplace. What? Change the workplace. What? Kind of like workplace change. Did you say change the workplace? Yeah. How? Specifically. Um, higher wages. Like higher wages. wages. What kind of wage? A minimum wage. Write that down. Remember all the things that the progressive stood for? Safer working conditions. Ladies, what did the progressive say about you? You ought to vote. Get that ace women need to vote in this country. And he gave this long list of progressive things. What was he really saying? He was saying Taft ain't getting the job done. Yeah. He said Taft didn't get the job done. Who can get the job done? Him. Me. Me. Well, in 1912, the fourth down was added to football. You don't have to write this down. It was a big ship sailed out of England called the Titanic, and it sank. The first buffalo head nickel was minted by the U.S. Treasury. And to the surprise of no one, who announced I'm running for president? TR. Teddy Roosevelt. TR. Uh, we'll take it up there next time we have election. Good session today. Y'all did a good job. Special.